Good morning. Uh, as we kind of settle in, I got a couple of announcements I want to share with you. Uh, first of all, um, uh, we're going to continue uh, for this Sunday. You guys get to stay in the service again. I know, you're, you're going like, yay, you got to listen to John. Um, so we, we're still lacking a, a leader for our, our junior youth down there. Carrie is getting better and should be back next Sunday. We'll pray for that. So we'll pray for that um, as, as she recovers on that. But for now, we're going we're gonna to have this. And if you need some cheese crackers, there's probably plenty up here. So that'll maybe get you through it. Um, the second thing that I want to announce is a little more somber. Um, you probably have, those of you who are on the email prayer chain have received word that Tasha's father is, uh, has been battling you know, a little bit, and he actually did pass away last night. Um, I want to let you folks know that we are deeply as a family appreciative of all the prayers that we've received, all the, all the concerns and the well wishes. And uh, I've been telling folks today that it is, it is a blessing because he had a lot of underlying conditions that were either going to be a slow, long process or this what turned into a relatively uh, peaceful passing for him this last evening. Uh, so we do appreciate the prayers, uh, the continued prayers for the family for peace. Um, and I also want to re uh, encourage you and re remind you to be praying for the Skiles family and for the Kime family as well. Um, so there's, uh, there's ample Ample call for uh, just remembering folks and thinking about them and praying for their comfort today. And again, uh, from Tasha and myself, we thank you deeply for all of the concern that you've expressed already. So thank you for that. Um, I don't believe I have any more announcements. I'll sit down and then I'll get back up and if I remember it. So Leroy, could you begin our service today? Good morning. I want to welcome you all here, and if you're a guest, I hope you feel at home here this morning. And I think it's, a, look, as Pastor Young just mentioned, it's time we need to remember all of those that are absent or are sick with this dreaded disease that's going around, and just with not only that, but just other health problems. We just need to keep our families and our friends in our prayers. Okay, the morning scripture comes from John 15, 12 through 17. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I have learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command, love each other. Will you join me in a word of prayer? Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to come to your house and worship you. We just ask, Lord, you will be with each one of us and with our family and friends, and a special touch upon those that need your special healing hand today, Lord. We just ask this in thy precious name, Lord, and be with John as he brings us your word today. Open our hearts to hear it, Lord. We ask this in thy precious name, dear Jesus. Amen. Let's stand and sing, I serve a risen Savior. And it's in the back of the blue hymnal, number four. A little pocket right in the back of the blue hymnal. No, this way. And I'll sing the melody except for that high F that uh, when we get there. So, I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that He is reaping whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy And just the time I need him He's always near He lives, he lives, he lives 
He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives revelation to impart. You ask me how he lives. He within my heart. In all the world around me, I see his loving care. And though I never will despair, know that he is leading through all the stormy blast. The day of his appearing will come at last. He, he lives. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Rejoice, rejoice, your voice and sing. <sighs> The hope of all who want, the help of all who find, none other is so loving, so loved and kind. He lives, he lives. He walks with me and talks with me along I stare away. He lives, he lives to impart you ask me how I know he lives he lives within my heart please be seated <laughs> good morning gentlemen Boy, there's some enthusiastic looking faces this morning. You gonna make it? <laughs> he looks tired. So. so, today we're gonna talk about, with the adults, we're gonna talk about, and you guys get, you can listen in if you want, uh, but we're gonna talk about Jesus calling the disciples. The story we're gonna look at, and you've probably heard this one, I'll just go over briefly kind of how it goes. Um, Jesus is walking along the Sea of Galilee and he sees these two guys. You know this one. He sees these two guys, Simon and Andrew. Simon's going to be Peter a little bit later. What are they doing? Do you know? remember the story? What was their job, Simon and Andrew? Fishermen, exactly. And they had nets that they would use to catch fish. They were a cast net where they would throw it out and it would make a big loop and it would sink down to the bottom and trap any fish and they'd have to wait out and pull it in. So that's how they fished. They didn't use like a rod and a reel. And Jesus said, leave your nets and come and follow me. And I will make you fishers of people and not fish. And then he goes on a little further and he sees two other guys. You guys remember who they were? James and John was the, the next people, the next two guys that he, that he came across. They were also fishermen. They were in the boats with their dad, Zebedee, and they were doing the work that they had. And it wasn't for fun. This is their job. And Jesus told them the same thing. He said, come and follow me. And they did. They dropped their nets and they went off. And, and, and Zebedee probably was like going, hey, where are you guys going? We've got work to do. But he had some hired help that he was able to, to bring in and they could continue fishing. And so that Simon and Andrew and James and John were able to follow Jesus. And that's what I want to talk a little bit about is what it means to follow something. You guys understand what Jesus was doing when he called them to follow Kind of have an idea about that. Basically, he said, I'm going to have you come and watch me and learn from me and hear my teaching and see my example so that you can do that kind of stuff. So do you guys have any kind of relationships like that with anybody? It's a little, yeah, Intel? Mom and Dad. Yeah, that's a good one. Good job, Mom and Dad. <laughs> All the time too, right? Yeah. I'm sure. It's one of the things that following somebody means you're watching and learning from them. Um, a good illustration, you guys have a favorite sports team? What's your favorite sports team? 
Oh, the Seahawks. Was that yours too? The Red Sox. Well, I'm going to talk about the Seahawks, okay? My aunt used to live in Seattle, and she was a really big fan of the Seahawks. She used to watch them all the time, and she would actually say to us, hey, the Seahawks game is on this afternoon. If you want to, we can text back and forth and, and actually watch the game together. And so we would watch it while she was watching it, but she knew way more than we did. Well, she used to live in Seattle, and she moved to Florida, so do you think she changed teams when she moved down there? Nope, she's still a Seahawks fan. She follows the Seahawks, and so we do the same thing. I'm not that excited about it, but she really is, and I like her, and so I want to I want to spend that time with her. But she's not even the crazy fans. How many of you, when you watch football games, see these guys out in the stadium and they've like got face paint on and they got maybe they don't have their shirts on, it's all painted up and everything like that? In Seattle, they call it the twelfth man because they're so loud. There's only supposed to be eleven people on the field, but yeah, there's no fans right now. <laughs> Not very many people following football right now. But uh, those people, they're the super loudest fans, yeah. Mm-hmm. So those people are following the Seahawks. They are into it, and they know everything about it, and they watch them, and they do this kind of thing uh, where, they're, where they're just there all the time when they're talking about it. That's not exactly like following Jesus because those people probably aren't going to be professional football players, are they? They're watching the game. Jesus says, I want you to follow me with the same kind of devotion as a super football fan that, that follows a football team, but rather than just watching, I want you to do what I do. And Jesus gives us the strength to do that. So, you guys kind of have an idea now about discipleship and what Jesus wants you to do? Can we do it together? Yes. We're going to do it together. Excellent. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, we thank you for the that you gave us to come and follow. We thank you for the example of the first disciples and how they followed faithfully. Lord, it means that we have to give up some stuff. A lot of the things in our old life have to be left behind if we're going to follow you and be your disciples. But we pray that you would give us the strength and the courage to do it. We pray that it would be that way for these young gentlemen, that they would uh, follow faithfully in their lives, and that we also would be faithful in our following so that we'd be good disciples. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks. You can grab an activity kit if you want there. All right, we're scheduled to sing uh, 523. We're going across the page to 522. I exercise my... Uh, I was raised in a Baptist hymnal, so there's a lot of these I have no idea. <laughs> I'm learning them, yes. Let's stand together, shall we? My Jesus, I
No, David chose a different song. We're going to look at 523 for a second anyway. I, I love that first verse. There's something in there that struck me this morning. It was just like, oh my goodness. Whittier writes, Dear Lord and Father of mankind, forgive our foolish ways. Reclothe us in our rightful mind. And then he goes on, and I'm thinking to myself, we think we're in our right mind when we're doing stuff in the world. But really being in our right mind might be something a little different than what we think it is. And this fits so well with our theme for today about discipleship. Uh, I want you to kind of hold that thought in mind. Maybe we're a little crazier than we should be and we want to be in our rightful mind. I want to invite you to take your Bibles and turn to Mark's Gospel. Again, we're in the first chapter. I have two texts for today. One uh, that follows that sequential pattern that we've been following. And then we're going to jump ahead to chapter 3, um, which uh, talks about the same topic, and I'm going to put these two passages together. So begin, to begin with, we're going to look at Mark 1, 14, 20, and then just a page or two over, we're going to take a look at that uh, third chapter, 13 through 19. So, so to begin with, and again, this is after Jesus comes out of the wilderness. He's been tempted. He's succeeded uh, in, in resisting that temptation. And uh, so he, he begins into his formal ministry. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come near, he said. The kingdom of God has come. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people at once. At once. They left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them. And they left their father, Zebedee, in the boat with the hired men and followed him. And then forward to the third chapter. Beginning in the 13th verse, Mark writes, Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted. And they came to him. He appointed twelve that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. These are the twelve he appointed. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. To them he gave the name Boranagers, which means the sons of thunder. Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Again, we are... At the beginning of Mark's gospel, taking a look at the beginning of the story here, but really to take a look at this story in particular, we need to skip forward to the end of the gospel account, specifically the end of Matthew's gospel account. Matthew chapter 28, the last verses of that last chapter of the book, we've got this wonderful text about the story about the commissioning of the followers of Jesus. So put on your Easter thinking and uh, the Resurrection Sunday and, and remember back to this, this passion story. All of the horrors of the crucifixion that they'd experienced, they'd gone, just gone through this. And after that and all the fear and the trauma and the, 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 the unsettledness and the, the anger and the disagreements and all the things that happened at that time, the word starts to get out that Jesus is not actually in the grave that there were those that had seen him, that were testifying that, that, that he was not dead, that he had in fact been resurrected, raised from the dead. These women who go down to the tomb so early in the morning, they're, they're going to go and, and minister to the body. They're greeted by an angel of the Lord who tells them that Jesus is not there, that he'd been resurrected, and that he was going ahead of them to Galilee. And that the followers were all supposed to head up in that direction and, and meet Jesus there. And then 
as if it needed a confirmation, there's still this powerful confirmation of the angel's word. Jesus himself shows up and says the very same thing. I want you to go to Galilee and I'll meet you there. So once the followers of Jesus, the the 11 that remained in this this central group, that last one we heard in that list is is off the scene now, and probably a, a significant crowd of others that are not mentioned, they finally accept the truth of the women's word and, and they, they head north to Galilee. And there, they encounter Jesus. Jesus is there. He's on the mountain that he told them to go and, and meet him at. And, and here's where Jesus gives them the work that they're supposed to do. They're commissioned. That's why we call this passage the, the Great Commission. All of that stuff that they had experienced with Jesus. All the, the teaching and both in word and in deed, all of the example, everything that had been exhibited in the life of Jesus, now all of that gets put into practice. Now you start doing it. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, Jesus says, and so here's what I want you to do. Go and make disciples. So hang on to that. I want you to see the significance of of that command. You see, Jesus is not interested in some flaccid, cheap gospel that doesn't require anything of, its, of those that accept it. He doesn't want to tell his followers, go out and save people. Or go out and get people to accept me. He says, go and make disciples. That's the work that they are given. And if that's what Jesus wants... Clearly, that's what he says. If that's what he wants, and more importantly, if that's what Jesus actually did himself, make disciples, then we need to get our head around this idea. We need to start thinking clearly about what it means to be a disciple and to make disciples if we're going to do it. We need to understand what's going on. This whole endeavor, the whole Christian endeavor is kind of pointless if we don't actually follow through on this. Now, one theologian who has examined discipleship closely is Bill Hull. Now, I find Hull to be pretty good. Uh, He offers a pretty good way for us to understand how discipleship works. He's examined it biblically, and he's put it into kind of a context that we can understand for our time. In his comprehensive guide uh, to biblical discipleship, he offers four key ingredients to discipleship. I'm going to paraphrase them a little as we go through these because I want to see if we can connect them. I think we can to Mark's gospel account. First of all, Hull says that disciples need a vision to inspire. They need to be looking at something if they're going to be a disciple of that thing. In essence, we need to, we need to have something to pattern our lives on. If you're a disciple of the Seahawks, then I guess there's probably going to be some blue and green in your closet, right? We need to have something to pattern our lives on. And obviously, for Christians, you know what that is. It's Jesus. Jesus is the pattern. Now, here's where we see a divergence uh, in between what Jesus is doing and the classic patterns of discipleship. It would have been understood at the time, if you were familiar at all with Greek culture at the time, you knew that there were these philosophers that would have taken on disciples in order to teach them their philosophy. A Jewish rabbi would have done similar things. They would have taken on disciples to pass along their interpretation of the law, the Torah. But the disciples of Jesus don't follow a philosophy. They don't follow an interpretation of the law. A disciple of Jesus follows Jesus. I'm going to hit this point over and over again, so get ready. Our vision is not the right reading of Scripture. Our vision is not the right way of thinking. It's not a philosophy. What we're patterning our life on, what we are looking at constantly is Jesus. We follow a living God. We follow a living God, not a dead set of rules. Now, Hull points out that a key component of Jesus' example is Jesus' humility, his submission to the Father. Jesus is a perfect example of that. And that's kind of important as we move on to our second ingredient. Next, Hull says that a disciple needs accountability. 
Now, I know when we talk about accountability in our very independent and individualistic culture, it gets a little bit uncomfortable, doesn't it? It can be tricky. Accountability uh, often turns into following the wrong thing. We, our temptation is to try to, to force others to, 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 to our will, and we call that accountability. What Hull suggests is this. Another individual, maybe one or two, importantly another disciple who will help us by encouraging us to keep on the way. Now, key to this accountability structure is trust. There needs to be trust in this relationship. If one is not trusted, then accountability is out of the question. And we can see a glimmer of the way this accountability, this mutual encouragement works if you turn to Acts 15. In Acts 15, there's a a passage about one of the first church councils. Basically, they had an argument. (laughs) They had to get together to figure something out. This was where, where they're starting to explore this idea of ministry to the Gentiles and what that might look like. And within this, they are accountable to each other. They listen to each other, they hear each other, and they encourage each other. And actions that could have resulted in the destruction, the dissolution of the Christian church, were instead an opportunity to to enter into this, this wonderful and new and exciting ministry, one that we ought to be eternally grateful for. If salvation and the church began and ended with the Jews, where would we be? Accountability must be viewed through the lens of the first point that we talked about, that vision, uh, that our vision and our discipleship are totally focused on Jesus. Accountability is the encouragement to follow Jesus uh, as we ourselves follow Jesus, allowing somebody that we trust to have a say in our spiritual development. It requires humility on our part. And that's what Jesus displays so perfectly Humility will be the fruit of following Jesus faithfully. If we're really doing what Jesus did, that humility will be part of it. There's no room for pride or ego in discipleship. The third thing that Hull points out is that discipleship requires structure. It's not enough for us to simply call ourselves a disciple and say, yeah, I'm a disciple. We have to actually live as a disciple in some sort of framework Now, most of you have experienced school at some point in your past, and you know that there are things that you can do to take in the knowledge that you need to take in. Cramming for the test right before, the night before, not a great way to do it. You may have gotten some of the answers from that, but that's not really a good method. It's not a good structure to learn things. The structure of Jesus' initial discipling experiment, the one where he calls these guys together and, and names them the twelve, that included prioritizing spending time with Jesus. When Jesus called the first four of them, uh, Simon and Andrew and James and John, he said, you, what you're doing, stop doing it and come and follow me. Spend time with me. The structure was them for them to trade their current vocation, the thing that they were doing. And don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with what they were doing. That's a, that's a legitimate trade that they were in, engaged in. It was, it was good for them to do that. It, it provided for their families. But Jesus said, right now, follow me. Leave that and follow me. It's a pretty radical call, isn't it? To leave something that seems good. To follow something better. But that's what Jesus did. They were, these, these, these men were called to follow Jesus and spend their days in Jesus' company, hearing what he, did, what he said, seeing what he did. Now, Hull suggests that the disciplined study of Scripture might be one of these structures that we can have, a group devotional time where we gather together with other believers and share what we've learned from Scripture might be one of these structures. Really, anything that compels us to action can be beneficial. Spiritual disciplines like The scriptural study and the prayer and and service to our neighbor in the name of God, these are all things that can provide that discipling structure that we need to really inhabit our identity as the followers of Jesus. Finally, the fourth point, Hull highlights the need for relationships. Now, this is different than the accountability piece that he had, he mentioned earlier. And it makes perfect sense when you think about it in light of the model that we see in scriptures. Jesus does not call individuals to have an individual relationship with him. He calls the disciples to be a group, a community that, that, that work together to further God's kingdom. 
the relational nature of discipleship, it reinforces the principles that we've already looked at. Humility and trust. Those things don't really function if you don't have the relationship. And the relationship falls apart if you don't have the humility and the trust. We'll see a little bit later in Mark, in the ninth chapter, we'll see the disciples rending the fabric of relationship with their vanity and their pride, arguing about who it is that's the most important in the group. Which one of us is, is the best, Jesus? It damages the relationship. You see, all functional relationships, and you've probably experienced this, all of them are are founded on mutual trust. You have to trust the person that you're with, and there can be no accountability or no meaningful spiritual growth without humility. If we don't look to others and say, how can I be better? In another book, the book Patterns of Discipleship in the New Testament, the theologian Larry Hutardo uh, notes that for Mark... Discipleship is what it's all about. Discipleship is at the very center of Mark's gospel, of his, of his book. It's all about discipleship. Why is there no birth narrative in, in Mark's gospel? Because it's not important to Mark. That's not part of the story for him. You can see, the beginning of the gospel isn't when Jesus is born, but when Jesus enters into this, uh, this discipleship relationship with his followers. He talks about it in his introduction It's enough for Mark to affirm who Jesus is in that really quick way that he does in the baptism. What more do you need than a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son, I'm I'm well pleased with him. That tells us who Jesus is, and then we move on from that. Mark wants to move quickly to the, the very meat of the gospel, the absolute need for believers in Jesus to be followers of Jesus. I know we kind of throw that word around as a little bit of a cliche, but this is more than that. Followers of Jesus, disciples of Jesus. Hurtado says that Mark begins with Jesus' baptism because baptism is where the life of discipleship begins. That's where we start. And Mark's story of Jesus then concentrates on Jesus' mission. There's not a lot of space given to the teachings of Jesus that's more found in other Gospels because the disciple is called to follow Jesus' example. What does Jesus do? That's what you do. Now, in Mark's first chapter, Jesus has just come out of the wilderness. We mentioned that. And he begins to proclaim this good news. If you want to pick it up on that 14th verse, the, the gospel. He begins to proclaim it in Galilee. Now, the location is important for Mark. Jesus is not headed to the the the, the centers of political power, religious power. He doesn't go to Jerusalem. He doesn't go to Rome. He goes to Galilee because he's not going to be a Messiah who works within the established system. He's going to be a voice from the outside. He starts out in the hinterland, in the countryside, in a place where the Jewish world blends into the Gentile world. They called it Galilee of the Gentiles. This is a liminal space, a border space where Jesus begins to proclaim this gospel message. Mark wants us to know that this all happens after the arrest of John. John, the forerunner now, he, he, he moves from the stage. He served his purpose. Now it's Jesus' time. And Jesus proclaims this good news. The kingdom of God is at hand and the time has come to repent and believe. Let's take a look at that. We need to like look at for a moment at the structure of this, this gospel message that Jesus proclaims. There's two components to it. it. Really simply breaks down this way. One component is God's action. And one component is our response. What God does and how we respond to it. The coming of the kingdom of God, that's not something we can do. That's not something that we can bring about. That is only something that God does. Now, we could spend some time talking about what Mark means about the kingdom of God and what it means to have it come near, to be at hand. But the point that I want you to really get a hold of here today is that the coming of the kingdom, whether it's realized or inaugurated or whatever language you want to use for that, the coming of the kingdom is God's work. It's what God does. God brings this near. God comes to us. This is an important point. So 
So all of this good stuff that the kingdom brings, all the good stuff that the, the kingdom represents, the, the eventual restoration of all things, everything being made new, the, the eternal communion with God, all of that stuff, that happens because God wants it to happen. This isn't something we bring about. But because God does want it to happen, because God does want it, it should stimulate a response, right? It should stimulate some kind of response. That's the repent and believe part. When we see what God does in bringing the kingdom near and how glorious and wonderful that is, we need to respond. And to respond appropriately, we repent and we believe. Real simple. I mean, those are simple words. They're not real highfalutin theological. They're not the $10 theological words. Repent, basically, I'm doing something that I shouldn't do. I better do something that I should do. I should turn away from what I am doing that's not right. You don't have to raise your hands. How many of you are doing something that you shouldn't do? You don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> Seriously. Are any of us doing everything that we should do and nothing we shouldn't do? Repentance is something we deal with on a daily basis. Now, there's, one, there's that, that salvation repentance that, that, that invites us into this justified relationship with God. But then there's the daily saying, oh, Jesus, I did it again. I need to turn around and go the right way. That's the discipleship repentance that we're talking about. But anyway... We do this. We recognize that we're not doing what we should do, and we believe that there's something that we should do. But it's not until we get to the next part that, that Mark shares for us, that, that Mark introduces us to, that we start to explore this what it is that we should do. Okay, so we're going this way, the wrong way. We recognize that. We know we need to repent. And so we turn around and we believe, but we do need to start going the right direction. Turning around and believing, that's the start. But going in the right direction is the natural outgrowth of that. We've repented, we believed, so then what? Verse 16 says that Jesus is walking along the shore of the lake. It's a sunny day, I don't know, maybe. He sees these guys out there fishing. Simon, again, this is, this is Peter and his brother Andrew. And they're out there casting their nets on the water and they're they're bringing in the fish. And Jesus says to them, follow me. Lay down that stuff that you're working with and follow me. And I'm going to make you fish for men. It's a great, great little pun there that he has. And he goes a little further along and he sees a couple other guys, James and John, and they're there with their dad. And they're, they're fishing. And, and Jesus says the same to them. Follow me. And they get out of their boats and they follow Jesus. And like I said, with the kids, Zebedee's there going, where are you guys going? We got work to do here. Or maybe he was supportive. We don't know. The Bible doesn't, doesn't tell us this. But they do drop what they're doing and follow Jesus. Now there's some indication in the other Gospels that there may have been a relationship between Jesus and these guys, uh, these fishermen. But Mark doesn't say anything about that. That's not what Mark's interested in. Mark makes it look a little more immediate because that's, again, a favorite word. Immediately they do this. And I think it's to make this point. Another rabbi, well, another rabbi teaching, gathering a group of disciples. In that situation, the disciples would come to the rabbi and apply for admittance in his school. Teach me, rabbi. Teach me, rabbi. And the rabbi would go, okay, I got some room. You can move in here. You look like you might be a good student. When it comes to Jesus and his followers, though, the, the opposite happens. These are guys that are out there doing their thing, and they don't have any intention of leaving that. They like it. It's working pretty good for them. But when Jesus comes, Jesus calls them. Jesus calls them. Jesus is the one that initiates this. And he doesn't call them to come and learn about his interpretation of the law. Let me tell you what I think about it. He doesn't call them to come and He says, come and follow me. Jesus is at the center of this call. It's not a doctrine. It's not a dogma. It's not a tradition. It's not a social convention. It's not a philosophy. It's Jesus that they are called to follow. Come and follow Jesus. 
In chapter 3, we get the book end. It's the other end of this process of gathering up the followers. In 13 of that third chapter, Jesus goes up on the mountain, and that's the standard location for an encounter with the divine, the mountain. He goes up on the mountain, and you get that? Did you get that phrase that he said there? Calls those whom he wanted. Jesus, again, initiates this call. Such a powerful statement. I don't want you to miss it. I'm I'm hitting on this, I know. Jesus calls those he wants. Jesus wants you. Jesus wants you. Because Jesus loves you. So Jesus calls who he wants. And again, the focus should not be on us coming to Jesus. Jesus calls us first and we respond. We don't bring about the kingdom. That's something that God does. We're simply invited to participate. Come, come along and, and, and do your part in this. We don't carry the church. We don't do this directing, guiding the fellowship of believers. That's something that the Spirit does. We join in with what God is already doing. It's something so essential for us to understand when it comes to this idea of being Jesus' disciple. Jesus calls us. The kingdom is at hand. All of these good things are happening, not because we get it right or because we're so cool or we're so competent, We know things, but because God wants it. God wants it. The disciples, when they were at their best, they were the best that they could be when they were focused on Jesus and not their own agendas when Jesus was at the center. So Jesus on the mountain calls those whom he wants. He's in charge. He calls them up and he gives them work. They're to go. They're to go. This is really the same language that we find at the end of Matthew's gospel. They're to go. The apostle, the word apostle, it means sent one, a representative, an ambassador, somebody who goes. And they're to go and they're to proclaim the gospel. Okay? The twelve are also given Jesus' authority over the spiritual realm. Now, remember the content of the gospel, what they're supposed to proclaim. We looked at it again in the first chapter of, uh, uh, back in in chapter 1 of Mark, and that is what? God's kingdom is at hand, something that God is doing, and that people should repent and believe. Now, we can add the commission to this as part of the message because we're on this side of the grave now. There's maybe something different going on in the context of the gospel story itself. So we can, we can, we can continue in this to, to repent, believe, and then make disciples. That's the natural progression that flows out of belief. And the essence is still the same. God is doing something great God is doing something wonderful, amazing. God's doing this, this, this miraculous, redemptive thing, and we get a chance to join in. We can participate. We can enter into it and, 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 and be in this wonderful experience. And since God is doing all this miraculous stuff, we can see what we're doing by comparing it. We can see what we're doing that we shouldn't do. That's the repentance. And we can believe that we have an option, that we can turn from the things that that take our life and and embrace the things that give life. We can believe that Jesus makes all this possible. And then we become a follower of Jesus. We follow along. Believing in Jesus is responding to that call uh, with faithful following. We drop our nets and we take off after Jesus. Again, Think about how radical this call is. It is really easy for us to look at what Jesus does there on the shores of Galilee and say, well, that's fine for them. That's fine for them. They were special. There was something about them that goes beyond what an ordinary person... No, that is the same call that he gives each and every one of us. Drop what you are doing and follow me. You ready for that? That's a pretty radical call, isn't it? Mark moves on from there. He says who the 12 are. It's a great list. These are really cool guys. They're the smartest. They're the easiest to get along with. They're the most consistent people you could possibly imagine. Drawn from the the very top of the heap, right? No. No. These are crusty fishermen. <laughs> these, are, these are not great guys. They, you got one of them 
who's a tax collector, the most hated and despised person you can possibly imagine in that culture. And then you got one of them who's a zealot, whose whole reason for being is killing tax collectors. And Jesus puts them together at the same table. You've even got one who will sell Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. This is the group that that Jesus brings together and says, follow me. Tells us their names. Some of these names show up later in the story. We get to hear about them later on. Some of them just fade into obscurity. We don't really know what Thaddeus did. We don't, really, we, don't have, we don't have letters from Thaddeus. So we don't really know what happened to them, how they lived up to their calling. And the ones that we do see later in the story, they're not, a, they're not the perfect model of discipleship there either. Even after the Spirit comes upon them at Pentecost, they still struggle, they still argue, they still have these debates, they have to repent. Paul confronts Peter directly to his face because of the way that he pulls back from fellowship with the Gentiles. He writes about it in Galatians 2. The point is this, the discipleship, it's a, it's a lifelong process that these men have entered into, that these people, women too, that were there, it's a journey. It's a commitment that we renew again and again and again and again. And as we work at it, and this is the, the, the powerfully hopeful part for me, as we work at it, as we're equipped by the Spirit, as our willingness continues to follow, we, we, we're faithful in this, we will do better. We will do better. There's hope. That we don't have to stay where we're at. That, that, that God will lead us further on that we can be, have, respond with more faithfulness. Because the, the more we follow Jesus, the more we become like Jesus. Essentially, people in Jesus' time, they would have understood the basic principles of discipleship. It was part of their culture. They got it. But Jesus takes that basic idea of a master and a student or a set of students and he, and he makes something new out of it, something unexpected. Instead of offering something that followed along in those established social standards, uh, religious patterns, Jesus, because of who Jesus is, Jesus uses that principle of discipleship and he uses it to describe what total devotion to God really looks like. Jesus calls, not the other way around, and then Jesus sets this perfect pattern for us to follow. Everything that we need to do, Jesus did perfectly. And only in total devotion to Jesus will we be the disciples that we're meant to be. We can't have one foot in the boat and one foot following Jesus. It just doesn't work. Just like in Mark's account, we are called. We're called together. We're called together with other followers, gathered together as we all seek to be more like Jesus. And since we share this journey, we can, if we trust each other, if we have developed and earned that trust in each other, we can help each other on the way. We can encourage each other and exhort each other. We can call each other to account. We can mutually submit to the Spirit of God that we see in each other. And together, in relationship, we practice the disciplines of discipleship. That's the pattern that we follow, emulating Jesus to the best of our strength and trusting that the Spirit of God is going to make up for the rest. Mark begins the whole thing with discipleship. And then as we'll see, the whole gospel is full of what it means to be a disciple. But we, we start here, the calling of the first disciples. It's the very first thing that Jesus does after he establishes this is the gospel message. He goes and gets some people to follow him and learn from him. And as we see from Matthew's gospel, the, the discipleship, it closes the gospel account as well. It's the last thing that Jesus tells his followers is to be, go and make disciples. Be disciples by making disciples. I want you to do this. And Jesus commissions his followers to continue this work that he gives them and the one that he instituted. And one can sense it in the nearness of the kingdom of God. That's a good place to start. And one can recognize that all the stuff that they're doing, maybe they shouldn't be doing it. Maybe they need to look at a different way of doing things, and they can repent, and that's important too. It's an essential step. If we want to get on the right way, we've got to turn from the wrong way. Recognizing that what we've been doing is, is not what we should be doing. As important as that is, though, it only creates a vacuum if we don't actually move into 
the space that we are supposed to be in. We have to replace the things that we shouldn't be doing with things that we should be doing. That's the discipleship part, the following part. If we really truly believe, then faithfulness is going to be a sign of that belief. So, truly receiving the good news includes that following, includes that discipling response. We hear this call, and we drop what we're doing, and we follow with faith. And while we're probably not going to get it 100% right, we're probably going to stumble, we're probably going to make mistakes, being disciplined in following Jesus is what Jesus is after, not perfection. That will come. But faithfully follow now. And Jesus has called us to follow, to be his disciples, and he asks us if we love him more than anything else. And any disciple that's worth the name will say yes. I want to invite you to take your blue hymnal, and in the back of the hymnal there's a unison reading that I want to, I'd like us to share together. It's number 793. It's not printed in your bulletin, so I'm telling you what it is, and I'll give you time to get there. 793. Somebody told me this morning it's easy to find. It's right after 792. Everybody have that at the back of your blue hymnal? 793. Let's share this mutual and community commitment together. Join me. We commit ourselves to follow Jesus Christ through whom God has made friends with the world and in whose name we share the work of reconciliation. We commit ourselves to the way of the cross, living a life of simplicity, self-denial, and prayer. We commit ourselves to love each other, serving the church and sharing our time, talents, and possessions. We commit ourselves to care for the world bringing good news to the poor, setting free the oppressed, and proclaiming Jesus as liberator and Lord. In this commitment, we find joy, peace, and new life. Pray with me. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, you are making wonderful things happen and your son, the kingdom, has come near. And we are deeply grateful for all of the blessings that you've given us. But we recognize that in receiving this grace, that there is a proper response to be had by us, that we would enter into a life of discipleship. That we would leave behind the things of the world, the things that encumber, even the things that seem on the surface to be good. And that we would put all of our heart and our soul and our mind and our strength into loving you and being faithful followers. It's not an easy road, Lord. The world is so tempting at times to continue to embrace those things that you would ask us to leave behind. There is much, even as your children, that we could repent of. But we do. We turn from those things. We believe and the grace and the power of your Son, and we will be faithful. We will step into that life of discipleship, leaving all behind to follow you. And we do this in the power of your Spirit, because without you, we can't. We pray all of these things in the name of Christ. Amen. Bless thee the tie that binds in hearts in Christian love, the fellowship to kindred minds. 
do that above me for each other's woes. We pour our ardent prayers, our fears, our hopes. Sympathizing tear and six from sorrow, toil, and pain, and sin we shall be free, and perfect love and friendship reign. bow with me once again. Lord, we ask your blessing on your disciples, uh, the followers of Jesus. There are many names which you give us, your children, your servants, your possession, but we today claim this name of disciple as follower of you. We ask that you would give us the strength, the wisdom, the, the power of the Spirit to fulfill this commission that you've given us to make disciples by being disciples. Give us every opportunity that we possibly could to share your love in the world, to speak with grace and kindness, and to just be a shining example of what Jesus taught us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may go in peace.